through appropriate linkages and collaborations, Africa's universities of technology like this one must facilitate this and become trainers of innovators and the incubators of globally competitive innovations and innovators. This is how we will leapfrog our way beyond our present challenges, innovate our way from under the onerous burden of underdevelopment and become the continent envisioned in Agenda 2063. The capacity for technological research and development for innovation can enhance our capacity to attract investment and enable us to solve development challenges. I am inspired by the way our leaders throughout the continent and the people of Africa have engaged with the discourse around climate change. I am proud that we remain closely in touch with the nature and understand the connection between our actions and the survival of other forms of life, including ourselves. Politically speaking, we have the Africa Union Commission. I said we have two fundamental problems, climate change on one end and economic growth on another. For a very long time again, we have been subjected to a global financial architecture that is oppressive, that is unfair, where countries like Guinea-Bissau and Kenya and others, when they go to the financial markets, we find development resources at 10 percent, 12 percent, 15 percent, while countries in the global north go to the same markets and obtain development resources at half a percent, one percent, maybe two percent. Five, six, seven times more. It is not possible, ladies and gentlemen, for us to develop at the same rate when we go to the same markets, we get different, we get development resources at different rates. And we have firmly asked that there is an imperative movement that must change the framework of the international financial architecture to be fairer so that all of us can walk into the same markets and obtain development resources at equal and the same interest rates. We don't think it's too much to ask if we ask for fairness. We think it's the bare minimum anybody can ask. And I'm very proud that the voice of my brother and others, leaders collectively in our continent is beginning to bear fruit Number one, in COP28, the Nairobi Declaration position we took as African continent, as African continent made significant influence in the outcome of COP28, meaning that the world is beginning to take Africa seriously because we are speaking with one voice. And number two, the World Bank has now agreed that we are going to have consultations with 72 countries, among them Guinea, Bissau, and Kenya, on the next replenishment of the International Development Association resources for concessional financing 
as a first step in beginning to level the playing field when it comes to access to development resources. We shall champion the allocation of sufficient resources and investment to facilitate green climate positive industrialization in Africa as a reasonable developmental proposition and a matter of ecological justice for all humanity. This is why we demand the urgent reform of our multilateral governance architecture, especially the UN Security Council, for a more inclusive, democratic, peaceful, and secure international community. It is the biggest fallacy ever to say we are democratic nations when the institution that wields the most power on earth is controlled by only five countries and in a manner that is so undemocratic that no other countries have any say. Nobody votes for them. Nobody asks them any questions. Yet they can decide all manner of things about the rest of us. If there was an epitome of a dictatorship, an organization that is undemocratic, that pretends to supervise democracies, it is the United Nations Security Council. And there can never be any remedy to that institution until it is reformed and made much more democratic and sensitive to the issues of its membership. 